Mary, I am so excited to have you join me today. Everyone, thank you for hitting play to either watch this on YouTube or listen to this on the Exceptional Admins Podcast. I adore all of you that show up every two weeks to take in a new conversation. My conversation today is with Mary, a new relationship. We had a wonderful first call. We've actually had an event previously. I'll leave in the show notes for both locations on how to access that you and your future event that Mary and I ran together where we wanted to really give a lot of wisdom into the professional community. Um, I'm so excited, Mary. We are here and we have an amazing conversation teed up, especially for our guests that are joining us virtually. We don't see their boxes, but they're here and they're gonna pop up in the chat with questions throughout our conversation today. So Mary, thank you so much for spending some time with me. I'm excited to host you on the show. Thank you for having me, Helani. I'm excited to be here. It's so fun to have live guests. I will disclaim quickly that we have severe storms coming through here. And if I all of a sudden disappear, it is because I've lost internet. Um, Caitlin, wonderful EA on the call is also in the same area. So if we, we go MIA, it is from the storms. We've um, lost you. Well, yeah. maybe we'll wait for you to log back in. I'll pause recording yes. and then we can just pick it back up, which will be super organic. Okay. Perfect. Love it. When we were chatting during our first call, it was like just wonderful spitfire of the things that we love about this profession. For those that have followed along a lot, I'm no longer physically in the profession, but I am of service to clients, to professionals aspiring in this profession as administrative individuals. And we, we covered a lot. And one of the things was you transitioned from task heavy to trusted advisor. And I was like, oh, that's a conversation we need to have. We need to capture that conversation together with our energy. And so my first question is, you know, what kind of got you there? So let's hear kind of the evolution of your career. You just said before we started recording that you were also in radio at the beginning of your career, like myself. So if you even want to start back then, you know, it's just kind of fun to your point when we were unrecorded with no guests, like this career oftentimes picks us. And so kind of give us that evolution, kind of seeing where you started, where you kind of moved throughout your career. And then let's get to that first question, which will be about executive business partner. So take it away. Yeah, sure. So a little bit of background. Um, the EA rule finds you. I strongly believe that, um, especially because as we've discussed before, and some of you might know, there aren't a lot of if any rarely collegiate paths or further education paths for executive assistants. Um, occasionally you might see a certification, but you cannot go to a state university and say, I want to major in executive assisting. It, it doesn't, it's just not there. So um, I was very fortunate to have a mother that was a career executive assistant. Um, when I say career executive assistant, for those of you who might not know exactly what I mean by that, that means um, this is the chosen career path. It is not, I'm an EA to become this, or I'm an EA because I wanna move into that, is I am an EA. I am a doctor, I am a lawyer, I am an EA. And my mom was a career EA, and I loved her role. I loved her relationship with her bosses. I loved everything she did. Her days were so different. And I thought, gosh, I wanna do that, but I didn't really know how to get there. Um, so off I went to school, ended up majoring in journalism, which landed me into media and I became a receptionist and I loved it. I loved answering the phone. I loved controlling the mail. I loved scheduling meetings and welcoming guests. And I loved being hospitable and all of these things. And I thought this is, I am so comfortable at this desk. It was like my launch station. And, um, I remember like when someone would come up and sit there with me, I was like, mm, this is my space. I like, <laughs> this is my my area all of my things <laughs> and i just really started to take ownership of this role yeah, um yeah. ended up moving to the radio side where i was a coordinator doing more presentations and projects and things so i i had started at that point to transition from like phones and mail more into powerpoints and presentations and um when we would have like celebrities come in town they would have these crazy lists of asks and so <laughs> yes. i would help out the the production team with Okay, like JLo, for example, wanted everything to be white in a room, white food, white towels, white um, washcloths, white, ev white, like tea bag, literally white everything. It was mm -hmm. bizarre. JLo, mm -hmm. take it down a notch. <laughs> I love you. It was a lot. But I, it was so fun, that challenge to get all of these things. And, and what I started to really focus in on is I was a people pleaser is mm -hmm. what it all boiled down to. I wanted to make everybody happy all the time um not because i had been through any kind of trauma in my life where you know i needed to like 
fulfill like something missing it was genuinely just i wanted to please and get things done and it was such a challenge you know people were like gosh i can't find this anywhere and i was like mm, i'm gonna find it mm-hmm. and it was kind of like challenge accepted so i just grew through that ultimately had a friend from these um like coordinator and reception roles whose dad needed an ea at this um appliance company and it wasn't anything that's I a knew. big shift from <laughs> like sort of radio entertainment to appliances no yeah. ding but it's a big shift nope, it's a big it difference know your audience right you got a big audience shift there yeah it was a huge shift but i needed that on my resume mm-hmm. i needed that jump i needed that ea to be able to become an ea in these other industries and supporting these other c-suite people and i knew that i knew i needed that Mm -hmm. so i thought i'm gonna come here this is not my industry of choice but i'm gonna put in my time and i'm gonna build out these skill sets Mm. and um and that's what i did and then i landed in tech and grew and grew and grew and grew in tech um my advice one to anybody on the call is find your industry you can bounce industries your skill sets are transferable you, you can always use what you have in a different industry, but f- finding an industry that you love, that you're passionate about, it makes your job just so much more, more enjoyable. That's it, a it first makes- golden nugget. Love that. I, uh, yeah. And I love tech. I love everything about tech. Um, mm-hmm. I tried to go back to commercial real estate for a little bit and it wasn't for me. Um, I just wasn't passionate about it, but I love tech, all facets of it. Um, some people love healthcare, some love FinServe, some love big pharma. Mm-hmm. Um, but private equity, it, venture yeah. capital. Yeah. Entertainment. Yeah, right. Yeah, for sure. It yeah. helps on those rough days where you're like, oh, this job is hard. What am I doing? And you're like, I love this field. I love being a part of it. This is, and it helps you keep your mind on the, um, on the bigger picture. Yeah. That's a really great point. And it's interesting because talking about your evolution, I was describing before the recorded portion that I had been placed as a receptionist at a radio company in uh, California in the Sherman Oaks area, knew Mm -hmm. nothing really about it. But I felt just as you were sort of describing, I started as a receptionist, letting people through the locked door because we had a celebrity on the floor who was a radio personality. And um, I didn't have like a lot of the desk stuff. It was really just greet and access. There wasn't a chance to, and I had no idea what I was getting into until I started building a relationship with her, Dr. Laura Schlesinger, the wonderful radio talk show host, several best-selling author books. This was in the late nineties. I'm aging myself, (laughs) but that's okay. I always talk about my age, so I'm not uh, afraid to talk about it, but it's interesting because literally the launch pad, as you were describing, I was in that role for about three months until she told HR, I want that girl to be my executive and personal assistant. I was like, yeah, anything to get away from this desk. Cause for me, it was more boring than what you described. Sure. And I had no idea what I was signing up for. And as you kind of also mentioned, it's like, does this career pick you? Do you pick the career talking about your wonderful mom? Um, the career picked me. And then much like you and several people on this call that I know who are here with us, we live and breathe this career. Yeah. Some days we don't like it. It's the curse of loving the career. And then the other days we're like, this is my jam. This is totally my jam. So I love that. And I think it's really awesome, especially with that golden nugget, find your industry. And it's interesting because in the space of talent acquisition, which is what I'm doing on a regular basis, executive clients want someone with extensive experience in their industry. And I am often advocating, always advocating. I describe my background entertainment, restaurant, and a few others. And I said, would you hire me? And oftentimes they say, yes. I'm like, Mm -hmm. my diverse background is going to add value to your environment. Yes. Welcome them. And, um, they don't get it normally, unless someone like me is offering that alternative because they think the box. Right. And that's also where we're talking in this profession about the just assistant, or, you know, this is the trajectory path only admin one admin two, admin three. So we're here today talking about how to get and move towards the uh, executive business partner position. And so I loved hearing that story. And I wanted to add a little bit of mine during our pre-call. Go ahead. Yeah. You you really have to paint that transferable skill set narrative if you're going to jump industries. Um, And that's okay. But be ready on that interview to paint that narrative. Be ready Mm. to say, yes, I've been in tech for 10 years, but I worked on this magnitude of events. And I see here in the job description that here in this whatever healthcare role that you also need these events. And just because I plan that event in tech, the skill sets are transferable. And sometimes you have to walk the recruiter through that narrative (laughs) um, with those transferable skill sets. 
yeah. but they're there and they can go across any industry, but sometimes you have to, it's really painting a narrative and it's telling yeah. a story. And when you believe that narrative and when you're passionate about it, they do. Um, so true. It's the confidence. You need to create the intersection of your toolbox yeah. with the, excuse me, but very limited bullets of describing what they need, yeah. which I just had a very powerful conversation. I'm going to have a PS episode about internal HR mm -hmm. on why the job descriptions are written. So lean and quite honestly, in my view, boring that I'm like, yeah. oh my gosh, I understand now why they do that. And so I'll have a PS episode coming up soon for that, but you want to create to your point, the intersection. So as you marry, we're developing your toolbox, or as I like to call it, your suite of strengths. Mm -hmm. When you're putting your suite of strengths together, some might be your signature strength. Some might be developing strengths. And if you can create that uh, reconciliation against quote, their job posting on the things that you have to offer that reconcile with that, they're going to see you as a universal tool versus like, oh, you know, you only have this and this, mm -hmm. we do need to spell it out. And I'm constantly advocating for that. Yeah. Um, during our pre-call, you mentioned interviewing, which is a great segue, by the way, sure. uh, you mentioned interview being a two-way street. I can not, and I have more to say to the question, but I cannot like emphasize enough how important that is. Mm -hmm. It is all about mutual synergy. I am so big on that with the work that I do in Denver. I'm known as the CEO assistant matchmaker. It's got to be synergy. It's got to be connectivity. It's also got to be, you know, wow, do I already trust this person after the first interview? How is that possible? They don't normally have that. Um, so how does a mindset, you know, help someone land that administrative role kind of thinking about that two-way street from yeah. an interviewing perspective? And obviously is, I'll have thoughts too. Sure, go ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. This is, I would classify this and in, in not a dramatic way, absolutely as critical. It is critical that you walk into your interview, interviewing them as much as they are interviewing you. And here is why in an, in an administrative professional capacity, this is so important. You are working closely with another human being than anyone else in the entire company. The HR associate and their boss are not working as closely as you and the person you support. The person who is an accountant is not working as close with the CFO as you are working with your boss. When you are an administrative professional, you are an extension, a f literal and physical extension of that person. <laughs> and if it's not a match, it's going to it's going to be miserable. It's going to be miserable for both of you. And you're mm -hmm. going to try and you're going to spin your wheels to make it work. And you're going to try and become something you're not to please them because you're a people pleaser. And they're going to try and settle for what they're looking for because they want it to work so bad and don't want to onboard somebody again and don't have the time and don't want to seem like they're needy or any of these things. And you're both going to be in these very unhappy places. But if your personalities don't align, if the way you work doesn't align, and that doesn't mean you have to work the same because yin and yang work together. Opposites definitely attract. But if it's not a match, it's just not going to work. So you have to be confident enough to go into that interview knowing what you need, knowing what you're looking for. And so here's a perfect example of this. My mother, for example, does not look for or need a personal relationship for her boss. Now, that has changed a bit um, in, in her role now, but early on in her career, that was not what she looked for. She came in. She wanted to get her job done and go home. She didn't care about your weekend. She didn't want to know what you had for dinner. She just wanted to come in and do her stuff and go home. I'm not that way. I want to know where you went to dinner. Who'd you go with? What was it like? Did you have fun? Was it delicious? Should I go eat there? Um, now, somewhere in between, you know, you find a balance, like you don't have to become overnight best friends with your boss, but there are different kinds of people in the world and people look for different things. I had a boss who, after six months or more, did not know my children's names. Hmm. I did not love that. My mom would have cared less. She could not have cared less. She, she just didn't care about those things. It hurt me. It deep, it deeply hurt me because of who I am that they did not know my children's names, who I talked about time and time and time again. Mm -hmm. um, it hit different. It just was not, mm. um, not a good feeling for me. And so when I interviewed with my next boss, I sat in that interview and they said, you know, tell me a little bit about what you're looking for. And I said, it's really important to me that you know my kids' names. 
And he kind of stopped for a minute and he said, can you tell me a little more about that? And I said, yeah, here's why. Um, and I kind of told him the story and I said, I'm not sure what, what you're looking for, but I want to get to know each other because mm. for me to proactively think for you, for me to read your mind, for me mm. to know everything you need all of the time, I need to know you, but I also need you to know me. So when my life does this, there's right. empathy there and sure. there's grace there because someone who isn't born with empathy is not going to be able to fully wrap their brain mm. around a sick child or a spouse going through this or this happening in your life. Empathy mm -hmm. for people who don't have it is difficult. And so the more you create that relationship and the more you create those bonds and catalysts, the easier it is for somebody who's not empathetic to feel those things. Mm -hmm. And I remember walking away from that interview and I thought, he's going to take it or leave it. And that's yeah. okay because he's not for me if that weirded him out. Yeah. That's, that's not a fit. Yeah, which is and okay. Which yeah. is okay, but it just wouldn't be a fit for me. And he texted me, um, oh, like a couple days later and said, would love to have you on the team. Looking forward to meeting Chloe and Cal. And he said there, oh, he remembered wow. their names. And I was like, Free, oh, yeah, <laughs> this that's is great. I, mean, I yeah. was like a mess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but even just from a personal level, there's, there's from a, that's a personal thing, but from a professional side, you know, um, if they want you taking meeting minutes all the time and you hate meeting minutes and you don't like it, that might not be a fit for you. Now there's sure, a compromise sure. in things, but if they're looking for someone who is a pit bull and you tend to be a little more passive or maybe mm -hmm. a little more shy, you're mm -hmm. not a fit for them. Mm -hmm. If they don't have an open door policy and you're a strong question asker, they're not a fit for you. Mm -hmm. That's okay. That does not make them a bad person. Right. If they don't fit into your puzzle. Walk away. If Just you, if so much to unpack from all of that yeah. and um, little plug, thought it would be helpful. There are articles on the exceptional admins website. Mm -hmm. uh, Leah will drop those in the chat. We'll have them in the show notes for two interview um, suggestions on kind of how to position yourself. So that'll be a great compliment to what you were saying kind of at that 35,000 foot view. Um, I, what I heard, which isn't actually how you put it, but to put it for the listeners, what matters to you? And so I have an 80, 20 philosophy that in the 80% and make whatever number fits you, especially because we want to rec recognize those that may not have the freedom to be selective and they do need to find employment. Right. And so with that being said, give yourself some grace with this 80, 20. If you want to talk about the list of 80% of the things that you love to do, not including what's on the job description, right? Like just really having that manifestation of these are all the things, even if they're project-based or routine-based in that 80% category of the things that you like to do. Then you have what, excuse me, sucks in the 20% that you don't like to do, but that you will do because to your mindset, especially mentioned earlier, I love this industry. I really like my boss. I like my people. Today's just a bad day. It's not a bad life, right? And so in that 20% category, when you have to weave into the 20% of the things that you're not in love with, you're like, this will be over. This will be over. And you talk yourself through it, right? To get to the other side. So I would say, have that 80, 20 of labeling it, what matters to you and having that written out. And then kind of from a question perspective uh, for anyone that hears this or that those, the guests with us today, it's really great for you to run a part of the interview. As we talked about, it's a two-way street with the question. I would want to address in the first 30 days, these things could be four or five things. And you give a little bit of explanation of how you've done those four and five things in your past in roles like this, kind of painting the picture. And then your closing question is, how does that sound for our first 30 days together? Yeah. You've positioned, you've shown all of your strength, you've shown intentionality, you've also shown you're ahead of the game already, which we love, right? That anticipatory. And then if they have a, well, I'd also like to focus on this with you, or I've actually never done the second and third thing that you mentioned, like, wow, that's going to be new for me, or they're speechless, right? Yeah. Which would be an awesome thing. And it also puts you kind of to the point of our conversation, moving from task heavy to strategic, um, how are we positioning? And this is a big thing with those that know me, your verbal uh, uh, presence, your executive composure, and that posture. If we think of Andy in the Devil Wears Prada, 
very little, if any at all, executive posture at the beginning of taking that job. Mm -hmm. Then the clothes look amazing, right? Then the shoulders are back. Then she gets the Harry Potter manuscript. She has the ultimate executive presence. And so thinking about that for yourself, even in the interview is a really great way to one feel good because interviews are nerve wracking. Um, and I actually have coming out soon. We are recording this on the 5th of April, um, on my, um, podcast show interviewing composure. It's a PS episode, so it's brief. So everyone will uh, want to take that in. Okay. Let's go. We've got kind of a healthy boundaries question. I want to just spend a small amount of time on, because I'm excited to get to that strategic and project-based idea. Um, cause we could obviously talk about healthy boundaries for a really long time. So we're going to keep ourselves in our lane, yeah. right? Um, how do you set healthy boundaries when taking on and receiving tasks from other leaders than your boss. I want to repeat that taking on tasks from people who are not your boss. Now, granted, we are here to be of service to your point with your story about starting your career hospitable. You talked about people pleasing. It's a gift and a curse. I'm a recovering people pleaser. I actually have a podcast episode about it called keep people pleasing. It's on the show. And that one's already out live for people to take in, but let's us, I want to hear from you healthy boundaries when taking and receiving tasks from people that are not your boss. What's the wisdom? So this can be a tough one because it is inherently in us to say yes. Mm. And sometimes we just need to say no. Maybe we need to say no because we don't have the bandwidth. Maybe we need to say no because the person who's asking you to do this admittedly should be doing this themselves. I don't mean that in a rude way. I just mean people when they are overwhelmed or desperate or in a pinch will grasp at straws and when they see you and especially when they don't fully understand the magnitude of your role and think mm. that you just sit there and twiddle your thumbs mm -hmm. and wait for someone to say can you give me a coffee um which as i'm sure all of you on this call know is not a day in the life um they are very quick to say oh mary can do this oh, we'll just mm. ask mary or we'll just which is a compliment mary, right so we want to acknowledge Vanessa. that's a compliment right yeah. however yes it is a, con it's, we'll have her do it. We know she'll get it done or he'll get it done or we can pass it to whoever. But you are allowed to say no. The way you I'm sorry, say you need no. to repeat that. <laughs> what was that? Yes, you are allowed to say no. No you sometimes no. tastes like pepper. And if you like mm -hmm. pepper, no should taste like honey. Yes. When you say it. Okay, mm -hmm. keep going. You say no all day for your boss people come at you trying to get on their calendar and you're like nope i'm sorry this can't work out nope this isn't a priority for you uh no this meeting should actually be with this person instead no i can't schedule it this time they have a lunch no they have a basketball game with their family this time doesn't work you say no all day long for somebody else you can say no for you mm. but it's how you say no mm. that either makes you look like a jerk or that makes you look like a professional that is incredibly busy in their role in their career and would love to help, but simply cannot at this time. And so when, let's say you support a CFO and let's say after a team meeting, the CMO comes to you and says, hey, can you run these reports for me? And you you just don't have the time. You might actually really be into marketing and really excited about it and want to say yes. There's a couple ways you can approach this. The first thing I usually say is, oh gosh, I would love to help. You know what? Let me just double check with, my boss's name is Michael. Let me just double check with Michael to make sure we don't have anything on the radar that would come up oh, with this. Oh, yeah. Because I want to get this turned around for you quickly, but I'm working on a couple other projects and I'm not sure I'll be able to get it to you as quickly as you might need it. Mm. Then you're not like, no, sorry, I can't do this. This is your job or no, I can't do it, I don't want to, or just saying no. You have to lessen the blow or yeah. say it respectfully. Hey, I'd really like to help. Unfortunately, I'm working on these other projects and right now I can't, but next time you have a project, please come to me because I'd really love to work together more. Or I'd really exactly. like to learn more about this. Or yeah. that actually sounded like a lot of fun and I think I would have knocked it out of the park, but maybe so-and-so can help right now. They just wrapped a project up, maybe check with them or something like that. Excellent, there, yeah. There is a way to say it. I think we all get afraid to say no because we are afraid if we say no once, we'll never get asked again. 
or what are they going to think about you? Insubordinate. What, <laughs> yeah. And what kind of reputation are they going to start to develop verbally, yeah. you know, behind your back, which as the people pleaser in all of us, <clears throat> as I mentioned, is a gift and a curse. Um, it's like, but I don't want to ruin my reputation. I, and, and I will tell all of you this. And I talk about this in the people pleasing episode with a therapist on the topic. It feels good to be needed. Oh, I'll yeah. tell you though, now in our forties, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> I love to be needed, but there's selective neediness that, yes. and, and you said it sort of, um, without saying it, when you talked about the no, and I asked you to repeat every yes, you're saying no to something else and something else in that 80% that I mentioned earlier that matters yeah. that now you can't say yes to, or which we all know this, you're saying no to family. You're saying no to that workout. You're saying no to that private alone time with yourself. And then the burnout, which is another thing. Um, and that could totally be a great tangent. I want to point it out and I'd move away, but I'd be too distracting in my book library behind me. There's a book called the power of the positive. No. And it's a fantastic book. I have a books recommendation page on the exceptional admins website great place to plug it too, right? Just so that you guys can go and see um, book suggestions that are not common. For example, um, I'm going to start reading this one, Managing Annoying People, okay? Mm -hmm. You would not have probably found it. It was a few pages down on Amazon when I was just kind of looking for my next book. Um, so The Power of the Positive Note, and if you're an audiobook listener, uh, totally take that on um, and listen to it that way. It was really a great read. And so it really goes in line with the healthy boundaries. And I think you hit it on the nail. And so I want to compliment it by also saying the way that you're saying, you know, I really liked the idea of that. I wish I had the bandwidth for it now, but this other stuff that I'm doing, Hey, mm -hmm. so-and-so is done. I think they could be helpful. You weren't a dead end. That was the power of the positive. No, because you gave that redirection. And then yeah. you also had the positivity of, I'd really like to be considered next time. And so if we want to talk about something that those that know me well, and listen to the show, your brand, like how beautiful is that for your brand? We are Super still great. trying to solve the problem. Yeah. Nothing hits better than, let's say you're in a store and you're looking for, I don't a blue sweater. And they're like, gosh, I'm so sorry. We don't have any, but hey, the store down the street does. They not only sent you to a competitor or sent yeah. you to somebody else that could take their glory or take that workload because we all hold on to our work to make us feel, you know, accomplished and things, but they put their pride aside and mm -hmm. pushed you to somebody else to A, try to solve your problem, B, lift up somebody else and see it was the right thing to do it was just the right thing to do they're still trying to help and yeah. you can do that professionally yeah and not yeah. burn a bridge or yeah. turn somebody off to coming to you again before i get to my next question i want to leave with some healthy wisdom some of the things that we are covering do not establish themselves overnight no and if you can take, which I talk about micro updates, right? The next time your cell phone has an update for Apple users, right? 11.1, .1, it doesn't go to 12.0. There's 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. And when we see these updates happening around us, including Zoom and all of these tools, we think we need to constantly update ourselves, but take it to the level that they do. They do micro updates. Focus on one intentional thing that's in your 80% right? That you're excited about. And this was my biggest piece of advice when I was thinking about the power of the positive no and had a conversation with someone else. Try that no, the positive no with someone that totally knows your brand, totally yeah. knows what you do and what you manage every day and say, Hey, I want to kind of try out setting some healthy boundaries with just my bandwidth potential to be of service and give top service to everyone versus dilute myself. So that's yeah. some wisdom just to, it doesn't happen overnight. And some of us are really impatient. <laughs> and so yeah. if I told you anything to start on, start with building your patience, right? Start with building your patience. That's a good one. Okay. More strategic, yeah. project-based, right? Deciding to become more of that. And it doesn't have to be hundred yeah. percent, right? Some of these secretarial things that we love, cause it's where we have a lot of control. We love that control. Yeah. You're in control of it, uh, which control is a bit enticing and false reality, but project-based versus secretarial task-based, you know, how are you able to gain the trust of leadership to be assigned projects? Yeah. Tell us a so, little bit about that. So there is an art to 
starting to become a trusted advisor for your boss. It does not just happen lickety split. It is not an overnight thing like Kalani just touched on. It very much takes time. And so you have to be ready and willing to calmly approach a leader who has perhaps never looked at their administrative professional as a confidant. They've looked at them as this person books my flights, this person schedules my meetings, this person does these things, but they go to other people on their leadership team or their direct reports or someone outside of the office when they need advice. So what you first have to do as simple as it sounds, you have to start building that relationship. That trust comes with a relationship. It comes with having solid thoughts that make sense. It comes with you having confidence. Here's what I mean by that. Start, let's say your boss gets an email, someone wants to meet with them, and you know this is not a good use of their time. You Mm. know it's not. You know that this person maybe should be meeting, say you support the CFO and this person should be meeting with like the chief people officer or or you just in your gut, like listen to your gut. Your gut is telling you this isn't a good fit for this meeting. Instead of just scheduling that meeting, which we do because we were told to do that. So we just go and do that. This goes back to being able to say no. Try going to your boss and saying, hey, yeah. I saw this meeting <laughs> request come through. I'm not, I'm not, it's, I'm not getting good vibes on it. I don't think it's a fit for you. I don't think this is the best use of your time. I think this meeting would be better suited for this person to allow you some heads down time to focus on this that you've been working on. I, and they will stop in their tracks because you've you've got their back to them like this before and you've got their back. Absolutely. You've got, because you also know more than they know. (laughs) Yep. You've just advocated for them. And anytime someone makes us feel safe and secure, it doesn't matter what your personality is. It, it, it like the little nugget just lives there and they're like, oh gosh, they really had my back on that. Yeah. Yeah. And then the trust starts to be built. And so then the next time another meeting comes through, or maybe it's an employee that you know is a red flag and they're like, I need time on his calendar. Oh, don't we you love those crazy. ones? Those people are crazy. You got to <laughs> rein them in. You got to yeah. rein them in and you got to say, hey, you know what? I think he uh, should actually have this meeting with his manager first. Because why do we have an org chart if someone's going to go from here to here? Yeah. I think first we need to filter this through. And, oh, yeah, but I have an open door policy and, and it's okay. Find the time. I don't think this is the best use of your time. I think this person is a little erratic and is going to come at you. And I think they need to meet with their manager first Mm. because these issues are within their team, not within the company. That doesn't make my boss look like a jerk who doesn't have time. It's, It's on me to go back to that employee and make my boss look really good. And again, it's that gentle note. Hey, thank you so much for reaching out. Michael would love to meet with you. Let's do this. Go ahead and put time on your boss's calendar. I want to touch on a few of these things. Michael has a meeting with your manager in a couple weeks. I want to make sure you get to the right place. But I think a couple of these items they're working on internally. Let's start there. Mm. Let's start there first. Um, There's ways to like calm somebody out. There's a reason when you call your cable company, you start with customer service before you're escalated to escalations. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Your C-suite boss or your VP of this or whoever is escalations Mm. that's not where it starts so when you go into them and calmly say hey this isn't the best use of your time hey this should be with somebody else not only does it give them pride in their role but someone has their back and now you've officially become a gatekeeper that is Mm. when you are actually a gatekeeper Mm. from those conversations then you're sitting in there going through your one-on-one things and maybe they say hey i want you to pull a report on this you need to be able to become say hey I pulled this report and I noticed this. What are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Or, hey, I saw this come through. I'm not sure this is a good fit for the company. This philanthropic initiative doesn't really align with um, the direction our pillars are this quarter, or I don't know, whatever it might be. But you start coming in with your thoughts. You Mm. don't just take tasks. You start... I don't want to say pushing back, but sometimes it is a pushback. Sometimes, yeah, and it depends on on your audience. Yeah, it depends depends on on your your audiences. You start, you just start sharing your thoughts on it because you do have their back. You, your interests are their best interests. Mm -hmm. Like, 
So anything you say is not to harm them. It is to help them. Mm -hmm. So what you'll find is like one day, it, it'll just be like an epiphany. You'll be sitting there and they'll say, hey, what are your thoughts on this? And you're like, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, well, <laughs> let me tell you, I've been waiting for yeah, this. I got a list. Hold on. I yes. got to find it in my book. Yeah. Yes. And, but they're not going to open that door to that kind of a relationship unless a, you indicate you're comfortable with it. B, you exude confidence and knowledge on different topics. They're not going to look at you as someone to go to. If they have an HR question, they're going to HR. If they have a finance mm -hmm. question, they're going to finance. But mm -hmm. when they start to realize that you have a pulse on all of it mm, they start yeah. to come to you they know that you're having side conversations with the cfo they know you're having side conversations with this other leader and you're the pulse like they're i keep ball. thinking the pulse yeah, yeah the pulse you have a pulse on these things and it is possible it takes time it doesn't happen overnight um the patience nugget was yeah you have to so yeah. couple things and it ties and i'll start with this part uh, which is so great. And the wisdom you're sharing is, is good. And it, it applies to someone who is maybe at that precipice of, I'm going to start trying that. And then we have sort of the junior professionals who are like, oh, I wouldn't even be caught dead giving my opinion, which is okay. And yeah. there's also executives uh, to my point of the word audience. Some don't want that which then is a great to your mom, right? Just get yeah. to the point. This is what we're doing. Get stuff done. Um, knowing your audience is a really big thing and kind of going back to finding a trusted advisor, right? Having someone in the organization that really knows what you're facing every day and coming in and saying, Hey, I have an idea whether saying your opinion, it's up to you, depending on your audience. I have an idea about something that I've been exposed to recently. Can I run this idea past you? Wow. We didn't think about it that way. That trusted advisor may be your internal sponsor or mentor to start saying, you know, Mary had a great idea that she brought up to me. We should bring her into the meeting right now. And she should tell us. Yeah. That is an entry point that was, yes, a little bit skirting around directly with your executive, but it's still getting you a chance to exercise, which is my replacement word for confidence. You have trouble. People have trouble speaking up because they don't have a voice on the topic or they don't have a voice on the expertise. And yeah. so when we want to talk about finding your confidence, I often in my world reverse that to uh, switch that out to say, find your voice, find yeah. your voice on it flyby executives that want access to your executive, there's something bigger going on from the research yes. I continue to do with the facilitating I do yes. for leaders. 100%. There's something else. They want a quick touch point so that they know that they're good with the executive. And so there's more going on there. And I think also kind of to your point about, Hey, you know, I saw this email, mm -hmm. um, and Didi, you have a question. I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, I saw this email. I don't think that's a good use of your time. I have often, especially pre COVID and kind of now, again, that call is best served during windshield time. I want to book it yeah. when you're driving to that lunch. Yep. It's also going to, this person's a verbal processor. They like to talk a lot. They're going to be kind of confined to the 20 minute commute you have, and you're going to get to the point quickly. Yeah. Um, I have another program for 15, 30 and 45. And I talk about it at EA university of just like how to structure appointments, connections with people. Didi, I'm going to read your question. You create the pulse. Oh, I think maybe it's a comment and a question. You create the pulse. You are a true strategic partner to your leader. How do you work toward educating others in the organization to recognize that partnership? Didi, mm -hmm. that's a great question. Yeah. How uh, do you work toward educating others in the organization to recognize that partnership. What do you think, Mary? So some of that advocacy is going to come from your boss. And if you're thinking my boss isn't going to do that, then now it now it becomes your job. So imagine you're running for office. <laughs> um, you have to be direct and you have to be clear. So when that leader reaches out to you and says, hey, I need this and this and this, feel Here's a perfect example. At my last role, I needed bonus information for a handful of employees and I had to go to HR to get it. And HR said, um, I cannot give that information to you. I need to give it to your boss. And I said, they asked me to get this information. They trusted me to get this information from you. I'm coming to you to seek out information only you have that my boss, who's your boss, <laughs> has, has asked me to get sorry that's it's not going to be possible so then i copy in my artillery 
Hi, just reaching out again. Copied Michael here for visibility. Please send me bonus information for this person, this person, this person, and this person. Sometimes it is genuinely as aggressive as that. I hate mm. to say that, but it mm -hmm. is. Sometimes it really does get to that point because people build silos around their team and people um, don't view you as a trusted confidant and they think they can only, and, or maybe they're just nervous. Like, hey, I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to give her something that she really shouldn't have. What if sure. Mary wasn't asked to get that and she just yeah. wants to know what everybody's making. And there's hard. absolutely those things could be a part you of it. You never know. Um, also, when I first started a role, I find one-on-one -on -one time with the other leaders on the team just to kind of tell them how I roll. Mm. And I don't do it in a condescending way or a pretentious way. It is just a, hey, my whole role is to be a strategic business partner for this person. And sometimes that might mean I have to push back on a meeting with you. Or sometimes it might mean that I gear you in a direction. I'm just telling you now it's not personal. Um, but sometimes that's going to happen. Or I'm going to ask you, I always tell them I'll ask for an agenda for a meeting every time. And they don't yeah. like that. And they're yeah. like, well, I just need 30 minutes on his calendar. No. Talk about what? Nope going to need some bullet points. Yeah. And so I just set those expectations early on when I joined the role that this is what it, this is what it looks like. Mm -hmm. And I don't say it in a rude way, but it's j just so their expectations are realistic and set, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that there are going to be times where, and I, one thing I'm really a stickler on is you don't just put meeting on their calendar. You just right. don't put time on, I need you to work with me on it. Um, we're partners and yeah, I think when you tell them that you're partners with them as well, because you view them as an extension of your boss, mm -hmm. their guard goes down a little bit and they start to trust you as well. Well, they want to see you as a conduit, right? They want to see you as you. a conduit, not a roadblock. Yes. And again, who is your audience? How are you going to quote, deliver the message that Mary is talking about? And just as we're kind of wrapping up our time here, mm -hmm. rapport is really important. And I think you touched on something that to kind of Didi's question having some just even simple language, Didi's going to take the lead on this and then let me know. Yeah. That sentence in an email or in communication, and you would position maybe yourself to your executive to say, I really want to take the lead and cover just the first 50% for you. Yeah. So when you communicate in the meeting that I'm going to take the lead, I'm going to be all over it with follow-up, uh, updating people. That is also that self-advocacy. And then your executive hopefully feels like the relaxation in the shoulders of like, okay, great. You can take it over. Yes. Or I can listen into that meeting for you and give you a quick brief on what was covered since you are double booked or, you know, your, your flight has been delayed. You don't have to worry about participating. I'll take, you know, extensive notes for you and circle up with you. Um, I won't speak on your behalf, but I'll definitely say, I'll get you an answer. I'll do follow-up kind of showing, and maybe it's a soft marketing, you know, update discussion on a rebrand right? Maybe not something super intense, like financials that may be like really outside of your scope, but it'd be a great meeting to listen into. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a couple different things there that were offered Didi for your question. Thank you. And I think starting in with the executive as ultimately your sponsor in the organization, which I just yeah. did a panel discussion on the difference between mentor and sponsorship inside an organization and actually someone outside of your organization, I would highly encourage those uh, taking in this conversation, look into sponsorship and sort of start to find if maybe there's someone in the organization that can be kind of quote, the advocate and the sponsor to kind of put you in positions, meaning not positions on the org chart, but like in situations where you get additional exposure. It's yeah. all about becoming a historian. When you are a historian on a variety of things, you are trusted to the point that Mary gave quite a while ago, go ask Mary, right? Because she is viewed as a historian and also a creative problem solver who's intellectually mm -hmm. curious that will go out and find information. Um, Mary, this has been so amazing. I want to give anyone the opportunity if they want to drop in the chat, any kind of closing questions. Um, as we kind of wrap this up, we talked about a variety of things, the strategic business partner on finding your voice, which would mm -hmm. be also known as finding your confidence. Um, I mentioned the book, the power of the positive. No, because you're talking about saying yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, we covered the people pleaser. <laughs> um, so many of us can relate to that. I also want to highlight kind of here at the end, suite of strengths. We need to be thinking about that as we want to say, I have this strength. I don't use it enough. Mm -hmm. 
and then find the intersections. Even when we were talking about interviewing and you're not interviewing, but you're still kind of proving yourself in your role because you want to absorb more long-term so that one, you don't go stale, stagnant, and then become disengaged. Um, but suite of strengths. And then every yes is a no to something else. We kind of covered that as well. Just looking over my kind of notes here, your relationship with your boss, big one for me was always like knowing your audience and then trusted advisor, finding just those small little pockets. I mean, you gave just a really simple example. If we see the email, we see that request and we're like, they're asking for an hour. I'm going to want an agenda. I'm going to want to make it 30 minutes. I don't think an hour at this point is necessary. Um, and just kind of finding, as I've just mentioned, right. Your voice on being able to like, kind of try that. Um, this is great when you're supporting one person, but my team supports multiple senior leaders. How do we build those deep relationships with five people who may not sit in our offices? That's a really great question, Jackie. Thank you. Um, my best advice there, uh, and Jackie, if you don't have check-ins with these people, um, start them whether it's once a week or bi-weekly, um, whatever works for you and your team, even if it's just for 15 minutes or 20 minutes, but that face-to-face time is going to be critical. I would start off um, the first few minutes of the conversation sharing something about yourself. And I would absolutely message that person. Let's say uh, it's Connie in HR is one of your bosses you support. I would send a message to Connie in HR that says, hey, I want to get one-on-one time set up for us so we can start to get to know each other better. I think if I get to know you better, I'll be able to better anticipate your needs. And I want to make sure I am doing the, the best for you that I can. Would love if we could work off of this agenda. And then on that agenda, at the very top, put share something fun about ourselves. It's five minutes of their time. They're not going to fight you on it. No one's going to say, I am not sharing something about myself because that makes them look like some might. I'll say that some might, right? Because they're also probably tightly pressed on time and like, I don't have time for this check-in. Yeah. But you've got this check-in, try and share something about yourself. Start humanizing one another Mm. to each other and getting to know each other. You, you've got to build that relationship. And when you're remote, it's so hard. Mm. It's so hard to build it. Um, maybe you have slack or google chat or teams and maybe it's just something as simple as like once a week just checking in after they had like a huge meeting and sending a message say hey just wanted to check in and see how that meeting went that's actually a really great starting yeah start i like that those blocks in that trust and that rapport and and even if it's just one little message and maybe they don't respond back And if it's five people start with maybe the easiest one, because then you're going to start to create this expressive, um, ness between you and that person. And, and maybe visually with the eyeballs, they won't see it, but maybe they'll sort of see a connectivity Mm -hmm. change in Slack or these instant messaging tools, or even over email or in a video meeting. And I think one of the big things I learned during COVID, when I was interacting with clients, I'm like, what are you doing different now? They're like, we're having every Tuesday morning, a 30 minute check-in that has nothing to do with business. Mm -hmm. And we go with the topic. What was your favorite eighties movies? And the conversation just starts flowing, right? It was a small startup of like 10 people. And so they made that intention. Um, And again, as I've mentioned, so Jackie, uh, for you, you know, what is, um, who's your audience is a really big thing. So I think, I think that follow-up also after an email is soft and it's expect, it's not expected. So it's a bit of a surprise and it's kind of like, wow, there's that check-in that was connected to business, I think is a, a good idea. And then the, the setting that time together. Um, how would you best prioritize your time with your boss, especially when you feel, fill more than one role other than being his EA. And I know that you two are working together right now. So I may say how to best prioritize your time. That's such a unique question <laughs> that we yeah. could definitely carry on for that Oof. one. Yeah. Um, especially when you fill more than one role. Mm-hmm. Yeah other than being his EA. Yeah. That's an interesting, I would actually break out what you're doing into percentages and sort of decide, you know, every week we should have a quick call on your drive into work or before you've started, or even when you're on the Peloton, right? I used to do that when my executive was on the elliptical. I'm like, this is the elliptical time. This is my quick, easy personal conversations for the things that I need to get done for your house, changing the snow tires out to summer tires. Like we need to have a quick conversation. And it's where there's also think about this, uh, Caitlin, less great. Right. Uh, decision fatigue. That should be a whole nother conversation, but decision fatigue, if it's too deep in decision making, 
it has to be very specific on when you have that conversation. So you probably would not do that on the Peloton because there's also a little bit of the distraction. Um, so Caitlin, I know that you can connect with Mary about that outside of our visit today. Mary, this was great. We covered a lot of ground. Uh, we definitely went a little bit over. Uh, so thank you so much for your time and sharing your wisdom thank with you. us. I really appreciate you. Thank you, Halani. I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks for joining.